Hey guys, it's Sai, and welcome to Ace Podcast Nation, where you can find podcasts, interviews, and content on a variety of subjects, including football, mental health, films, wrestling, music, and more. You can keep up to date with what's happening on Ace Podcast Nation on our Twitter page and Facebook page. Uh, and we've also uh, just given away, or actually, I tell the porkies, I've just launched a competition which ends on Friday, but we're recording after we're we'll be, recording before it, but this is going afterwards. So I, I've just given away an Amazon Alexa and a fifteen pound Amazon voucher. So uh, if you follow us on all social medias, then uh, you can get involved on the competitions as well. Uh, so today's show is uh, strongly on football, particularly mental health and sport. Uh, you can find our first episode on mental health and sport series, which was with Tracy Donerkey, who was a sports psychologist. So the first episode was on sports psychology, which is uh, an interesting point of view. And uh, it certainly taught me some stuff. Uh, so I'm thrilled to be back, uh, thrilled, my guest, thrilled to have my guest back today. Though you guys didn't see the show because uh, I managed to corrupt the audio yeah. somehow. And we lost the whole show, which was a bit uh, a bit devastating. But I'm delighted to uh, welcome ex Premier League footballer, ex Coventry, ex Cardiff City, ex Hartlepool midfielder, Mr. Willie Boland. Thanks for joining me, Willie. Oh, yes, I'm no problem at all. Nice to nice to um, do the show with you. Cheers, buddy. Yes, uh, yeah. So, like I say, uh, I corrupted the audio last time, so I Willie wasted wasted Willie an hour of Willie's time, which I was really upset by i think i was more i was more upset than you which was a bit weird but you were like no don't worry don't worry it's fine and i was couldn't i was furious i was i was so angry i did, couldn't go to sleep that night but uh yeah it is what it is i suppose teething problems but thank you for coming back on mate i do appreciate it appreciate you finding the time um so just a quick little backstory because i don't want to go on about it too long because Obviously, me and Willie have already had this conversation, this part of it. But um, Willie and myself met back in 2004. Uh, we frequented the same pub, local pub. Um, my wife worked in said pub, now wife. Uh, both my wife and me, we sort of liked each other, but we just come out of relationships. We were a bit heartbroken or whatever. And we were sort of uh, skirting around it a bit. And we had uh, a long... All day in the, well, I had a long all day in the pub, should I say, watching uh, the Six Nations Wales play Scotland. A few, fair few beers. I think Willie and his partner at the time came in for a drink in the evening. My now wife finished work, and uh, basically Willie and uh, his partner did a bit of silver black in, and got us together. And uh, yeah, you know, fifteen years later, three kids and a house and a dog. So yeah. Thanks for that, mate. I don't know where. It's like, yeah. well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I definitely thank you. Definitely thank you, mate. But uh, yeah, it's just I was. I like to tell that story. I miss it. Does my Mrs. Eden? But like, obviously for us, we're both like lifelong Cardiff fans. So like for us, that's quite a cool part of our our story, should we say? And you just get to hear it every every anniversary. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> when I when I message you. <laughs> Uh, to, to be fair, listen, it's great though, isn't it? Like, you know, I'm, I mean, um, as you say, you've, you've contacted me a few times over over the previous years on the anniversary, like, you know, and it's always nice to hear, you know, you're still going strong, still going well. So, um, you know, that, that time in 2004, obviously, looking at you now, um, at least, I don't know what the score in the Wales game was that day, but at least something came of it. Anyway, I imagine Wales beat Scotland. You normally do anyway, don't you? Uh, i got to be honest. I drank so much that day that I <laughs> quite sure I think they won, but I'm not a big, uh, I'm not even a big rugby fan. I like, I'm all about football, but I'm really not that bothered about rugby that much. Like, I do watch the Six Nations games, so it's a bit ironic that both me and my missus, like, proper football fans, and we met because I was watching the rugby. Well, we didn't even meet, we meet, you know, we got together. Got so, together, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we're going to talk a bit about mental health in sport and football, obviously. Um, obviously, mental health is a hot topic at the, worldwide at the moment, particularly in the UK. It's obviously a very complex uh, subject and there's a lot of the intricacies to it. Um, and it's like that pressure to perform 
or the impact of failure, bad performance, it can have a knock-on effect on these athletes' day-to-day lives, um, especially with social media these days. I think they get an instant reaction, don't they, straight away. If they've been terrible, they get, especially at you know, the very top sort of Premier League championship, they're getting told by thousands and thousands of people instantly that they're crap or they've played crap or they've been crap. Yeah. And I think it's difficult enough, I would imagine, for a footballer, like obviously when you were playing, particularly when you sort of broke into football, social media wasn't a thing. So like yeah. you may have like, you know, if you'd been out on out and about on a night out or something and you see some fans, they might give you some polite feedback. But it wouldn't be like a constant thing. Would that be fair to say? No, no, definitely. Yeah, I mean, when I started, I mean, when I came over to England in, in what was it, 92, 93, um, you know, there was no such thing really as social media. So you weren't really open to um, the amount of criticism because around the place now and, and the trolls that are out there who have no better but to just, you know, try and make a name for themselves and, 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 and criticise them. Um, you know, I, I look at social media and it, it, it's got some very useful, um, you know, it is very useful for certain things, keeping in contact with people and stuff like that. And also obviously finding out things and, and keeping up with the news. Um, but the mental health aspect of it, and it's extremely difficult, as you said already, there's so many interstices with, with mental, health, mental health, but I suppose I can comment on it from a sport point of view, um, that it, it can be, it can be tough um and i don't care who who, who you are um to, to listen to criticism to hear criticism uh, and not constructive criticism but nasty criticism trying to um slag you off can can be quite hurtful and it can affect people there's no doubt in that and it's a part of the game where i think clubs have obviously taken steps because of the social media aspects i know from working within academies that you know, have workshops now for young kids and parents um, in regards to social media, um, the pitfalls of it, um, and how it, how it can be used um, in a positive manner rather than in a negative manner. But you're always going to get um, people out there criticising you, opposing fans, your own fans, um, and it's it's part of it's part of um, the game that players. You need to be, you know, educated a, a, a lot more on, especially young players coming through. And, I, and to be fair to clubs, I think they are doing that. Yeah, and I think, I think you're right. I think a lot, of, not a lot, some of the stuff which I'm going to talk to you about actually is uh, around sort of young players and what clubs can do to help them, you know, manage different aspects of their lives. But if we stick with the social media just for a sec, the, an interesting thing has been going on on Twitter over the last couple of days. Mm-hmm. Is um, there was a Manchester United versus Bayern Munich treble, uh, like a you know legend game, yeah. and then um, so you had Jesse Lingard uh, dressed. I don't know. I'm just I assume it's, that's what kids dress like these days. He had like a suit and like a some sort of hat on. To me, it looked silly, but you know I'm 37, so like maybe I'm not supposed to think it's cool. Do you know? But like, <laughs> yeah. um, and I think. Ra- say, say a similar sort of thing with Rashford. Now, they're two Man United Academy boys who you'd think would get the backing off the fans no matter what, because they're generally, with the academy players, quite protective. But the abuse they've got is unbelievable. And whilst I understand they both of them, you know, Lingard had a very poor season, Rashford had a little spell when he went on a bit of a run, but either side of that, he didn't have a great season. So I can understand the fans' frustration in that these players are not performing on the pitch, but then they're shilling their their aftershaves and their brand and their this and their that. So I can I can understand fans' frustration from that. And the, you know, they should be open to criticism. If they're not performing on the pitch, that's their job. They should be open to criticism. But I think there's got to be a line. And I think social media, the negative part of social media is that people almost forget the lot, you know, in, in real life, they wouldn't dream of saying those things to people or in their workplace or within the family, you know, at, at the dinner table or 
if they saw probably these, you know, some people probably would, but a lot of them, if they saw these players in real life, it's almost like social media and the internet gives them like this protective cover that they feel they can just say whatever they want and nothing will come of it. And I think more and more over the years, last couple of years, that line has got further people, more and more people are going over that line and it's becoming racial, it's becoming just yeah. abusive. There's there's no excuse for like the abuse that these boys get. And like Jesse Lingard's 27, and I think Rashford's 22. Like, when I was 22, I, I would not have responded well to the sorts of things that they have to put up to, put up with. And I think that's what people forget, is that these boys are human beings. And that, yeah. you know, if they play badly, it is affecting them. It does make a difference to how they feel the next day the day you know before the next game um and one of the things you said to me actually in our last show was that sometimes particularly in that first season at cardiff where you would struggle to sort of settle in a bit it's like you didn't you you would not that you didn't want to go out but you were like sort of it would cross your mind about going out on like a saturday night because you might see some cardiff fans and you knew you hadn't been performing so, like, that's an example straight away of where, you know, that, the, like, the mental stress of it or the mental part of the game had an impact on you in that first season, would you say? No, it, it definitely did. And, and as you said, we had this conversation last week because obviously it never got recorded. Um, people wouldn't have heard that. Yeah, my first season in Cardiff, I, um, I, I had a difficult time. I, I didn't play well. I, 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 um, I, I suffered with a lack of confidence, um, coming to a different level, um, didn't adapt as well as I as, as I hoped. And and that kind of um reflected on my performances. Um and, and with those performances you, you feel an element of at the time, an element of guilt that if you're not performing well and the team aren't winning, of how you conduct yourself away from away from the football club. So Yes, it 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 affected me in in relation to would I go out, um, would I be able to go for a meal um, out in public? Look as if I'm enjoying myself after performing well, as after performing poorly, in 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 the previous day's game, or even that day's game, um, and it did, and, and I think it weighed heavy on my mind stuff like that. I didn't want to be seen that. Um, after a team losing a game or after not performing well, that I should be going out laughing and joking, and fans would be having a look at me saying, "How the hell can he go out and laugh and joke after we losing today?" Um, and I agree with you. I, I, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have been like that. I should have been able to separate my own, own private life away from my work life. Um, and the reason why I didn't, because I think football is so different to other, to other um, professions in that. You know, the fans who ultimately are the football club, they're always going to be there before me and after me. They care so much for the football club that, um, and I'm not saying all fans, I would say some fans would look at me and think, well, how the hell can he go out after that performance today? Um, and that does happen. And, and, and I didn't want to put myself in that position. And, and so that would affect me socially, um, which would indirectly affect me mentally because if you're not out socializing with people and as humans should be doing so um then you can suffer elements of you know being low um even some people might even hit the, the depths of depression because ultimately what's happening on a football pitch is affecting your everyday life which can affect your family life which can affect your your well-being your and your and your, and your mental mental well-being and, and I look back at it now and think, well, do you know what? I shouldn't have been like that. I shouldn't have been like that. I, I'm going out on a football pitch and whether it's down to lack of confidence or, or, or performance or not being good enough, just because I can't reach the, the levels of performance that people would have expected of me doesn't mean to say that I can't go and enjoy my free time. Um, and I should have been able to separate that. And, and I didn't. And, and, and I struggled to do that initially. And it's, it's because I cared. Um, I did care about how I played and, and, and how I performed but I suppose I was younger and inexperienced and, and I felt that that it wouldn't be right 
to go and do that. And I still feel that players with the amount of social media that's out there today would, would, would be thinking the same thing. Um, and, and fans need to try and understand that we are only human beings. Um, and the argument on the other side would be, oh, these players are feeling sorry for themselves. Blah, blah, blah. They're getting paid so much money. I wish I could take that amount of abuse and get the amount of money that he's getting. Um, now, I've never earned an awful lot of money, um, but I could safely say that no matter how much money you earn, I'm, I'm sure that nobody would be um, able to deal with the amount of abuse that some people get. I mean, I mean Beckham was a prime example after the World Cup. Um, I mean, was it back in 2002? Um, mm. Or was it 98? Was it 2002, I think? 2002, anyway, wasn't it? Yeah, it was when he got sent off, and, and, and here's a player who you know, was getting absolutely abused left, right and centre from fans all over the country. For, yes, it was a silly moment, but, I mean, do you deserve that amount of abuse and ridicule for a silly moment on a football pitch? And that's how passionate some of the fans are and and how hateful they can be as well. And social media now is just a platform for trolls and for people to put their opinions out there, which is free speech and you can't stop it. Um, but I, I honestly can't see how somebody can go behind a keyboard or behind their smartphone and type in something just for the sake of it to try and upset somebody else. Um, I, I, I just can't see the sense in it. I really don't. Um, I never have done. Um, I understand in football you're going to get you know abuse from the fans from time to time on the sidelines but let it be there and then you know that's where we play our game let it be there from a three o'clock to five o'clock that's what we're paid to do we're paid to go and perform ourselves yes we need to conduct ourselves in a, in, in a professional manner away from the football pitch to make sure that we're good role models but you know that's the platform that's where we're performing if we're not performing well okay it comes hand in hand with with the job but away from that, then, does it have to continue on after that? Away from the football pitch constantly, um, trying to, you know, upset people, trying to make, have, have an impact, a negative impact on these people. Me, personally, I find it difficult and, and hard to understand, but that's just me personally. Everyone's different. Everyone thinks about football differently. Um, people would... People down in Cardiff or Hartlepool or Coventry where I played football will be a lot more passionate about those clubs than I have been. I just had the pleasure of playing for those football clubs um, and I always look out for them. But I'm, not, I'm never going to be as passionate and as, you know, um, I'm not going to let that result of Cardiff, Hartlepool or Coventry at a weekend upset my whole weekend where some fans do. It is their whole weekend how that team gets on and I, I understand the passion that's involved in that. I just wish that fans would understand that the people that are out there on the football pitch aren't trying to make mistakes. They're not trying to perform badly. They're not trying, um, you know, to, to lose a game for your club. It's it's just player, people who are put in a position to play for those football clubs who are very privileged to play for those football clubs and, and are trying their best. And sometimes that might not be good enough for a number of reasons, whether they're not good enough or whether the opposition are just better. So... That to me is is common sense when it comes to football um, and supporters. But we all know that there's always banter involved in football, and there's always uh, winding people up and stuff like that, and that's part and parcel of it as well. But when it gets extreme levels, which which you can do and has done, and going back to the Rashford and 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 the um, Lingard comment that you said at the start, um, I think with the end of the season, the way things have gone at Manchester United, when Solskjaer came in, things were all great and, and the whole lot. And, at towards in the marine negative and I think because of the results petered out and there was a couple of bad results towards the end. Then you had ex players like Roy Keane and Gary Neville talking about, you know, the players being so interested in other things. I think that can feed the beast. I think that can feed negativity towards those players. Um and then you have to look at the players themselves and, and think are they getting ridiculed because of the way they dress or is this an ongoing thing or because of their social media presence and what they're doing away from football as well? These are other things that need to be taken into consideration as well. So um, if they're in a situation like that, can they manage themselves a little bit better? Um, possibly. But does it warrant the amount of abuse that they get? I don't think so. 
No, no, I agree. And I think um, the thing to bear in mind as well is, you know, like Joe Bloggs, just a normal guy who's got an office job. If he's in a high pressure office job or he's having a stressful time at work, you you can take that home with you. You can you feel it, feel the pressure even with a job like that. Um, and just because these players get paid millions of pounds doesn't exempt them from feeling the pressure and feeling the strain or feeling down when things don't go their way. Yes, they don't feel the passion for the clubs unless they're a hometown boy, as it were, but they still have got things like pride in their performance. They still want to win trophies. They still want to win the games. So they're going to take it home with them. Um, and I think people forget that very, very easily. Um, I'm similar to you. I I don't understand, even away from social media, I've never really got the, the thing around saying things to people just to just to upset them, just to hurt them, just to... I don't really get it. That's just me. But like I said earlier, I think social media gives these people this air of comfortability where they can they think they can just say anything they want and it won't matter and often you know over the last sort of five or six years you'll you know every now and again you'll see someone won't you they'll say something really you know offensive or really horrible people will find out where they work tell their employer and they end up getting sacked for a stupid comment which they've made on like a saturday evening to some footballer because their team's lost and then suddenly their livelihood's gone. And I think that's another, obviously that's separate from like the football and mental health, but from a social media point of view, that's something which I think everyone should be, should bear in mind is what they put on social media does have an effect. If you, if you, if I go for a job interview tomorrow, um, they will search my social media sites. You know, they'll search all my social media posts to make sure that I haven't said anything or I'm not involved in anything, which I shouldn't be. Um, and I think, you know, all people should be aware of that. Um, yeah, and on that point, Simon, as well, and I think people are, are aware of that, to be honest with you, because I think if you look at a lot of people's profiles, it's never their, their, their real name. Sometimes it's pseudonym or, or something like that. So... I think the people who are out there who are, who are obviously throwing abuse out there in the whole land, I think they're pretty clued into that regard that, you know, people can come and search. And it's, I, I, and not that, I, not that I scroll through a lot of social media, I'm on it from time to time. And, you know, as I said from the very start, it's good. It's a good tool to keep in contact with people and find out what's happening with people and stuff like that. But I'd imagine if you'd, if you'd searched some comments from some of the trolls it wouldn't be the real name it would be it would be something different like a nickname or something yeah. like that yeah yeah um so yeah yeah you're totally right and and people will do their due diligence by checking out people on social media especially this day and age but i think people are probably aware that and can get around that yeah um, okay, so moving back towards sort of football and stuff, you say, um, I think you mentioned you've worked at like some academies and stuff. So obviously, depending on the club, the, you know, the pressure can vary. Um, speaking of like young lads, so with kids who are just below that sort of 16, 17, where they start getting the, you know, the apprenticeships or the pro contracts, I feel like there's a lot of pressure on those kids because they almost feel like every time they play for these academies or they go for a trial or they go for a training session, they feel like if they make a mistake, they're not going to be a professional footballer, even though it's like 0.012% of people ever make it anyway. But when I spoke to um, Tracy, the lady uh, sports psychologist, she actually was telling me about like instances where she had seen kids who had been in academies from like age seven and then they got to like 15 16 and then suddenly they were dropped um and then and then she was saying like that's a massive effect on their mental health because they they've done that pretty much the whole life they can remember within two weeks the clubs have forgotten them because they decided for whatever reason that they didn't want them but those kids then at 16 all of a sudden can have 
go on to have, you know, it, whether it lasts a month or it can last longer and lead to other problems where it can create, you know, create severe mental health problems for them. Just, it's, di like, it's difficult for clubs, isn't it? Because clubs are looking for the next superstar or at the very least first team players. So they've got like that, but then I feel like they should be aware of the sort of 14, 15 year olds who are dreaming of this and are working hard and then they're putting everything into it. I've, it's a big, I can be a big blow to be dropped. Now, obviously you went on to be a professional footballer. I played at like a decent level till about 14, 15. And it, it is a lot of pressure. Um, my son's 14 and he's like in the sort of academy system now. And he, it's only over the last year that he's managed to settle himself. But from like, about eight to 13, 12, 13, he was um, in like the development centers. So like just underneath the academies. Um, yeah. And he's a go he's a goalkeeper and he was finding it really difficult because what he would, he would feel like he had to, if he made a mistake, that was it. He was never going to be a professional footballer. And it took me, he's taken me years to get to him to understand, look, just enjoy it, do your best, work hard, and just develop. And if you develop and you're good enough, then you'll play and you'll go on. If you don't, then just develop to be the best you can and go into coaching or physio or you know whatever you want to go into. But yeah, not all parents do that. And I've seen a few who put a lot of pressure on their kids and they're in the coach's ears. And all these things, I think, you may say different, I think they all add to just pressure on the kid. I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, it'd be, it'd be stupid of me to disagree with you because at the end of the day, um, when you're a kid or when you're any any age at all whatsoever you want to go and be able to concentrate on your game without any sort of interference from anybody else at all you know you get your instructions from your coach or your manager during the week or before the game and then you want to just go out there and concentrate on your game obviously when you're out there on the pitch when you're a bit more of a senior player you will you know you'll help players around you and you'll give them instructions but as a young player coming through the academy system uh, from 9 to 16 or 9 to 21 um you want to be able to go out there and and play without any fear and play without any fear of making mistakes um, and that will come from the setup itself whether it's the coach whether it's the academy manager um, that first and foremost that all these kids and parents um, should be made aware that when they're taking this journey this journey is for them to become better footballers better people um, you know more respectful how to conduct themselves towards coaches opposition um, referees, um, you know, teaching them discipline, um, punctuality, um, learning them, uh, you know, morals of, of how to be a footballer, be more professional, um, educating them on, on the, the mental side of the game, the physical side of the game, um, the tactical side of the game, and obviously the technical side of the game, hitting those four corners. If these kids and parents are made aware from the very start that at the end of this journey, there's a very good chance that you're not going to be a professional footballer, but you're going to improve in all these aspects of your game, then the disappointment won't be as bad. It'll definitely still be there because every one of those kids wants to be a professional footballer. Yeah. Of course they do. And they will be gutted and disappointed when the journey finishes. But if they're made aware from the start that this is a journey for them to improve in all those aspects, and then at the end of that, there's a chance that you could become a professional footballer, but only a small chance. And at least they're being made aware of what's ahead rather than being promised the sun, the moon and the stars uh, and being told if you continue down this road, you'll be a professional for you learn, blah, 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 blah. If you're in the right environment and, and with the right people around them and, and the parents have a huge part to play um, in the development of their kid um, because the amount of pressure that the parents put on the kid is probably more than anybody else, depending on the parent. I was extremely lucky to have a parent who our parents should have said my father would um wouldn't interfere in any of my football games at all. He'd come and support and keep quiet on the sideline. 
and he wouldn't criticize me after the game or tell me what I did wrong. Um, and that for me was, you know, very liberating uh, in regards to I could do and express myself and do what I wanted to do without any fear of looking over my shoulder to see if my father was happy with what I did or not. So he yeah. gave me that platform to go and express myself and play. Very lucky to have coaches who, who were, had the same manner. So I wouldn't be having somebody screaming at me from the side and to say, oh, pass the ball to Johnny. Um, no, we were made to make our own decisions and that developed me as a footballer. And that's how that's how players develop. They develop by being given the freedom to go and express themselves, being able to make mistakes, being educated and being told uh, from the very start that this journey isn't a promise. This journey is an experience for you to improve. And if you improve well enough and, and you and you you know you're dedicated enough, then who knows what could be at the end of that journey. Also, education should be drilled into them as well. That's very 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 important to you know continue with their education because as as you've already said there with the figures that the players that make it, you need to make sure that you're concentrating on that. And to be fair, clubs are you know big on that. Um, and make sure that if the kids aren't behaving at school and and the work isn't up to scratch, that there's an understanding with parents that. You know, they'll, they'll miss training uh, and maybe miss games from time to time. It's a good carrot to have in from an educational point of view as well. So if it's managed properly, um, then it can be a good journey for kids. It's always going to be a disappointing journey. Of course it is. And a lot of people will, will say the academy system, you know, it, it's too early for kids. It's too regimented. They're not allowed to enjoy themselves. Um, I think if you're in the right, in the right environment, and at the right club, I think those things can happen. Yeah, yeah. But I'm not saying that happens at everywhere. Um, but well, and that's up to you as a parent, maybe to, to have a look at that and say, okay, well, is my kid in the right environment here? And and the other, the other flip side of that is looking at you need to be realistic and honest with yourself as well as a parent. Um, yeah. and not and not be point, not been trying to live the dream through your kid. Um, if you're looking at your kid and he's struggling, at if he's a 10-year-old kid and he's struggling under 10 level with his academy club and he's struggling to make an impact and you can see him in training and he's struggling a bit, it's not one of those where you point the finger at the coach or the other players or anything like that. Sometimes your your kid probably might not be up to that level and he might have to step down a level to go and enjoy his football again to maybe step back up again to that level. So you need we need to be realistic as well about where the kid is at from an ability point of view because what we want to be doing as well is making sure that kid is in the right is at the right level for him to enjoy his football. Because if he's struggling and he's suffering at a certain level, then he's not going to enjoy it. He's going to follow the love of the game. And it's the responsibility of the academy manager or the coaches to point that out to the parents and, and, and say this. And, and that's why sometimes kids come out of the academy system because they, they could have been on a journey for a while. A lot of things can happen. They might not develop as well as other players. They might have other players from outside developing past them. Um, you know, confidence-wise, they might not be one of the better ones in the group, so they're not being successful in training and games, and that can that can that can affect them as well. It's it's a really tricky, tricky, um, it's a tricky journey for for any any coach and manager or academy manager involved in the academy system because you're dealing with young kids, fragile minds, um, you know, who've got these dreams of becoming a footballer, and you're the one that needs to try and differentiate whether this kid has got a chance or whether he's struggling or whether he's prospering uh, and this is going to affect him and his parents and it's tough it's really really tough for young kids and it, it's it, it's it's very tough for coaches as well to to be saying to these young kids and parents that maybe this isn't the right level for you because you're ultimately you know smashing that kid's dreams yeah but you can't you can't you can't be unfair to that kid by keep him on that journey if he's visibly struggling and visibly not enjoying his football. Um, so it's 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 extremely tough uh, and I can understand I can understand people saying that there's a kid staying in the academy system from nine years of age and up to 16 and he gets released. I mean, mentally, what's that going to do to that kid? Like I said, if he's given the right information, if he's been, you know, if people are honest with him all the way through, then that blow will be softened. Yeah, he should be prepared for it a bit, at least, didn't it? Yeah, and it's always difficult yeah. because the kids don't want to hear that they might not be a professional footballer. And the parents no, don't want to hear that either. Um, so no. it's extremely difficult. 
it's funny you uh, you when you were speaking then you reminded me of my youngest son actually he was in a development center as well for for Cardiff um and he wasn't he was he was doing all right but he wasn't enjoying it at all like he didn't want to go and when he was there he sort of be off not really enjoying it so I took him out which was a big thing at the time because you know when he got sort of scouted and invited to go there it's huge for him he's like oh my god can't see well you know I'm gonna play for Cardiff which is a huge thing for him but it was it just wasn't right for him whether it was the the sessions the coaching the level I don't know so I moved took him out of there and then he got he went somewhere else um, and he's actually now training and playing with South Wales Football Centre, which is like a local uh, centre, which is linked to Taft's Wales Academy. Um, and he's in, the improvement in him in the two or 18 months he's been there compared to the 18 months he was with Cardiff is astronomical. Yeah. Now, there's nothing, you know, maybe he would have improved at the same rate just with age. But I do lean towards the fact that I think the coaching's a little bit better. I think he enjoys it, so he's more focused and concentrated, and he wants to go and he wants to play all the time. So I do think there's various facets to it in why he's improved, but I do believe that a big part of it is the fact that he wants to go, whereas even though the first few months it was, oh, my God, I'm going to Cardiff by a year it was oh have we got Cardiff tonight dad yeah no, I, I don't want to force him to do it so yeah if you just reminded me of that there um <clears throat> but like I say I've see, I've witnessed with the, between the two of them I've witnessed over the years some very pushy parents who think their kids are the next messy and can be quite rude to the other parents they can be quite rude to their kids. They can be quite forceful and forceful and rude to the coaches. And I just think that's just going to, only going to end one way. And it's going to be the kid who feels bad at the end of it. Because the club will go, or the coach will, you know, he might feel bad, but he ultimately will go on with his job. And it's the kid who will be left with the, the piece the pieces to pick up if you like i know that sounds a bit more you know no it'll be it'll be the kid that suffers because of yeah that's right yeah because of these parents actions i mean end of the day kids are kids whether it's at a professional football club or whether it's going down doing judo or whatever they'll they'll go down there because they they're enjoying it when they stop enjoying it then they won't want to do it and now when you've got pushy parents pushing them do things then they feel obligated to do that but as you pointed out there rightly about your uh, your son he obviously wasn't in, in in he wasn't enjoying it at Cardiff for whatever reason that might be whether it was the coach and as you mentioned or whether the level of player was better there than it was down in than down in the other place and maybe he felt that it was Cardiff and he felt he didn't fit in there it might be a confidence issue there's there's a lot of things that that it could have been um in relation to parents um they're they're the hardest part of 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 young footballers um pathway i i think um after after the kids ability then the parents are probably the next the next step because um you know at any level at all on a weekend when when these kids play games um if they if they lose three nil or four nil they'll be disappointed that they've lost that game but they'll go home and they'll have their shower and they'll go play with their mates and they'll have a bit of laugh and, and they'll have fun. Parents forget about, it. forget about it. The parents, however, will hold on to that result for longer. They'll probably go down to the local pub and have a point and whinge about the manager or the tactics or or his son playing out of position. I'm not saying this is every parent, I'm just saying this 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 can happen. Yeah. Um and kids, kids can let go of disappointment a lot quicker than, than adults can. They get on with things, and if parents can understand that, then I think they'll give their kid a better chance of enjoying their football and progressing. 
and improving and, and getting better. Um, and, and just realize, just be there as support. That's that's what, what we are as parents. We're there as support. We're there, you know, the commitment levels of parents you know, with, with involved with kids like this is huge, to be fair. It is huge commitment to get players to train and, you know, parents could be working nine to five. They got to get their kids, rush their kids to train and they got to wait around. They got to pick them up. They got to travel around the country with these kids, with these academy clubs. It's a lot of commitment and they do invest an awful lot of time. And I totally understand that. But it, it, they're doing this because because for their kids. Now, what you don't want to be doing is jeopardizing any chance that your kid has by, you know, putting added pressure on him or, or even putting more added pressure on him by interfering with, with the with the football club, with coaches and managers. Those coaches and managers are there because they're qualified to, to do what they do. And um, and parents should be respectful of that uh, and be there as, as a support for our kids. Now, don't get me wrong, if, if something's happened, which is, you know, out of context of what coaches and, and, and academy coaches should be doing, then obviously parents need to step in. But in general terms, you know, they shouldn't be going telling coaches what to do or what they should be doing with their son. They should be listening to coaches, taking advice and, and seeing how coach and parent can help that kid progress. Yeah, I completely agree. Absolutely. Um, so, Willie, if you go back to your career slightly, um, so like when you get your fr- or even just football in general, but so when you get your first pro deal or your apprenticeship, so you go from like a kid in the academy to training with the reserves or the youth team or the first team, whatever it may be. Um, obviously, there's a big difference straight away in the the pressure, the expectation. Maybe the work rates uh, or the workload, should I say? The, you know, the, there's a big difference in the both from kid kids football essentially still up to the men's football. Um, is that difficult to manage, like from a mental side as well as a physical side? Um, obviously the obviously the physical side would would be. You know, when you're 17, 18, breaking into the first team, the physical side would would be something that would be different. Of course, you're playing against men now every week rather than new team players or, or reserve team players. Um, me personally, when I when I broke into the first team initially, I I didn't really have any fear. Um, I think it, it it was an advantage as a young kid because there wasn't as much pressure on you as a young kid because. Because you're so called the so called young kid, then there would be an awful lot of responsibility on your shoulders to perform week in, week out. And if you did, then it was a massive bonus and it's great look at this young kid. Um, but it would normally be the seasoned pros who would be the ones who were expected to, you know, play at that high level week in, week out. Yeah. So when when there when you go in there with no pressure on you and you go in there as a young kid, you can go and enjoy it. You know, you you're not so scared of making mistakes. You don't want to make mistakes, but um, and it is it is a pressure cooker um, for anybody, but you have that element of um, no fear because there isn't as much pressure on you initially when you when you get in there. The adrenaline and uh, you know the sheer buzz of it all of being involved in games like this, like that, um, you should embrace. It's it's a little further down the line where okay, you've got into the first team, you made your impact. Now can you kick on? that's the period where it gets a little bit tougher mentally because there's a bit more expected of you because then it's when you, you've you established yourself and you've, you've made that place in the first team yours, then it's like, okay, well, now I've got to perform. Now I'm, you know, now I, I'm accountable for mistakes. I'm accountable for bad performances. Um, and you've got to deal with that from a mental side of, of, of view that you probably... I've never encountered before because it's a whole new level. It's a whole new level of, um, you know, coverage from media, uh, more fans involved. You know, first team, the first team. Obviously, you've got the whole support there. Whereas maybe at reserve games and and new team games, you only get a handful of people going to games like that. So, um, initially, not so much pressure. Once you're established, yeah, you become more accountable to your performances and how you deal with them. Um, and then once you go through your first patch, that's a real test as a footballer of how you react to to the disappointment of being dropped from the first team. How do you react to that? Um, is it is it because you're not good enough? Is it because you need a rest? Is it because 
in your um you're not playing well um is it because somebody else is is playing better than you now and is more suited to playing in the first team all these things are things that you need to sort of deal with in your own head um as a footballer um so that that can be difficult i think i think the the toughest part for a young footballer coming through now is is that dip in form he has after his initial impact and how he reacts to that yeah i think it's it must be a big big jump in many ways but then like you say the 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 age can almost be like a a benefit in that you just want to play you just want to show what you can do and you play without fear but then there's the other side of it maybe where after the game it's a bit more analytical of it particularly these days with sports science and they get the players in and they tell them how far they've run and you know how many passes they completed so there's that i suppose there's the, that aspect as well is that it's not just oh you've played a game you've won you recover you train you've got to go through the game these days and i'm not sure how much of that they used to do sort of when you were when you were playing in terms of you know like the stats and the the analytics that they've got these days i don't really know when they brought them in to be honest but i mean they that's got to have it's like another aspect to the mental side of the game isn't it because obviously as a kid you just play and then you go to training and then you play and you go training and then you play and to a certain extent with the academies as well you play you train you play you train but then you get to the first team you've got to study the opponent study you've got to do a man marking job or whatever there's all these different aspects to the the mental side of the game that must just I, I don't know if I'd say an added, it is an added pressure, I suppose, but it's more to think about than just playing football. Yeah, no, it is. And and that's the way I think also, um, and I'm not saying it's a necessity, but I, I think it definitely helps, is that to be as good as you can be in football, now we've all got different attributes, whether it's pace, strength, skill, technique, but to be better, again, with whatever attributes you have, I think you have to be intelligent. You have to be able to take on information and process it and put it into action. Um, and, and during games as well, being able to adapt to situations, um, to be able to self-reflect on your own performances without pointing fingers at other people, um, to be able to be honest with yourself. All those things will, will help you be a better footballer. Um, than what you are, than, 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 than what your, you know, your basic attributes are. Uh, and I think football intelligence, stroke intelligence, um, is a big factor in football's maximising um, their potential. Uh, and when you bring in the tactical side of stuff, it's important. Uh, you mentioned man marking and stuff like that, and the analytics side of things. Um, yeah, when you're given all this information, what are you going to do with it? Are you, are you going to take it on board? Are you going to process it? Are you going to do something about it? Or are you just going to ignore it and get on with things? Um, so intelligence for me is, is, for me personally, helped me. I mean, I could, I wouldn't say I was, you know, the strongest, fastest, most skillful, um, strongest, good in the air. No, none of those had no outstanding attribute. But what I could do is I, I, I could process things. I, I, I knew my job. Um, I knew other people's jobs. I, I knew how to organize things. Um, and I knew what was needed of me and others on, on the game. In training, I would take things on board. Um, and I would help the team in that way as well. Um, and that helped me maximize my potential as a footballer, where my other attributes wouldn't. So on that side of the game, and it is a mental side of the game as well, it's it's very important. I've seen plenty of footballers and played with plenty of footballers and trained with plenty of footballers who were had a lot more um, attributes, better attributes than what I had. But when it came to the sheer intelligence of, of what was happening during the game, the, the, there and then, of, or, or the here and now, should I say, of what was happening in the game, they, they looked like, you know, there's cotton headlights sort of thing. Like, you know, they didn't know how to react or how to act during that game. 
and going back to the younger side of younger players as well of you know when you're involved in the the, in the trust of a football game and you're a 17 18 year old kid and this is a huge game um and a lot of things are going on and he's not doing his job or he's not out off the ball and he's not paying attention then you will get senior players and you and they will dig that young lad out um on occasions maybe not initially when he's coming to the first team because you're trying to look after him you try and mind him but when he's getting through that period of, of being accountable then he's going to have to you know step up to the plate and that's where you, you you can see a lot of the younger players the so-called snowflake generation um you know faltering uh, and not being used to that because if you brought up through the academy system you don't really get that um mm. when you make that step up to first team football I think that's something that needs to be looked at and looked upon as well. And to be fair, um, I, I was at a presentation of, of um, Wigan Athletic Academy manager there a couple of weeks ago on a course that I was on. And he mentioned um, quite a few players have come through the academy and, you know, weren't quite ready for first team football, but they loaned them out to, you know, lower league teams. And because Wigan played a certain expansive type of football, when they went down to these lower league clubs, they struggled unbelievably. They just couldn't handle or get the grasp with the type of football that was being played because it was something that they just weren't used to. So what he has now introduced, which I think is a great idea, is it's like an 80%, 20% um, way of training. And the 80% is to stick to their, you know, their philosophy, their values of how to play football. But 20% is to mix it up a little bit. And that by mixing up a little bit is playing more direct, more cut and thrust football, more 50-50s and all that. And that makes sense to me because it will prepare our kids a little bit better for what could be realistically the, the, the next level they play before they might jump up to the next level. Um, and that's something that, you know, I, I think people are starting to look at it now and say, yes, we want to produce good footballers, but we also need to be able to produce players who are going to be able to, you know, take a little bit of flack take the physical, physical, physical sort of, um, getting his men fit the physical stuff that you're going to come up against, um, you know, throwing balls up in the air. So you're going to be have to head balls because it's always on the ground in academy football, all that stuff. So that's going to be introduced into their curriculum as well, which I think is a good idea and maybe something that other clubs should probably follow as well. Yes. Spot on. I think that's a really good idea because Sorry, one of the things you just said, when you were saying about the intelligence, I could almost hear people saying, well, David Beckham, he's not intelligent and he was one of the world's best. But actually, from a football intelligence point of view, he was one of the best ever. Yeah. He was yeah. so intelligent yeah. on the pitch. I know people will say, oh, he's not very intelligent off it. But I mean, his anticipation of the ball and what, and the where the play was going and the amount of times I'd watch him and the ball would be sort of over the left-hand side in the Man United half, and he would anticipate them winning the ball back a split second before they'd run it back, and he'd be gone right out wide he, from his sort of tucked-in position. And he used to do it time and time again, and I think he doesn't get enough credit for that. Um, well, I'll, sorry, tell you, that was... I'll tell you what, as well. I'll tell you what he doesn't get enough credit for as well. People say that he's not intelligent. I, I question that. With, with what he's done um, in relation to, you know, the amount of money that he's made um, through, you know, different branding, um, you know, his own, he had his own fragrance out for a while, his own fashion label. You don't do all this stuff by being stupid, you know what I mean? He's, no, you do not, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure he's quite intelligent. Maybe just because of the way he spoke, people thought he wasn't intelligent. But I'm, sh yeah. I'm, sure, he, I'm sure he's an intelligent guy. Oh God! You don't get where you don't get where he is uh, by being stupid. No. Um, obviously, there's many aspects to a player's career that c can contribute to strain or pressure or mental health issues, whether it's performance, atmosphere, fan opinion, abuse, or uh, off the field issues like gambling or drinking, drinking, etc., um, or uh, in injuries as well. Obviously, it's, uh, football's player's career is a short career you know like 20 to 30 is almost like the peak and then after 30 they've only got probably a few years left at the very top level and then you're retiring there's no other um you know 
sport is different to any other sort of workplace in that aspect. Um, and, you know, they're one bad injury away from being over with. You know, people like David Bust, who broke their leg in their early 20s, never played again. And, you know, there's many others who have in the same boat. And I think uh, one of the things, again, I discussed with Tracy was with these young players, particularly the ones who are getting paid a lot at 18, 19, is giving them some tools to, to manage their life. Like, you know, some of them are moving from home to this big, huge mansion. They've never paid any bills before. They've never managed money before. So as well as all the social media stuff, it's almost given them the skills to be able to manage their money so that they are putting maybe a little bit away. So if something happens, they, you know, they're not sort of stuffed. Um, and I think that's an important thing for the younger players to help them. It's particularly because they, because they, a lot of them, you know, they, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, training finishes sort of lunchtime. And then they're off in the afternoon. They've got everything they want in life in terms of materialistic things. So quite often, if they haven't got kids or, you know, like a family, they've just got a lot of money and a lot of time, which can lead to bad choices, getting in with the wrong crowd, gambling, whatever it may be. And, you know, obviously the PFA and organisations like that, uh, you know, try and help play these sorts of things and these issues. Um, do you think because football, boxing, fighting, things like that, because the careers are so short but so intense in that short period, do you think that's a big contribution to why we see so many uh, ex-sportsmen suffer with sort of mental health problems or addiction or, you know, issues after they've retired or they have trouble stepping away and they come out with retirement in boxing, you know, boxing and fighting. So I think that's a big part of it, like the, the intensity of that short career. Because I can just... Uh, no, I was just saying about my own per per personally, boys, I was saying that, um, you know, with young players now, there's, there's a lot more references to players that have gone through bad, bad situations, like with the Premier League, with the, with the, with the money that's been put into the game now, I mean, players need to be looked after a lot better by people. Um, you know, whether that's financial advisors or agents, just to secure their future. Because when professional football finishes, there's going to be no buzz like it, and, and they might try and find some sort of other buzz. But what they need to try and do is plan for the future, whether that's putting enough money away or looking at what they're going to do after football as well, so they can they can fit seamlessly straight into that, rather than you know finishing football and not knowing what they're going to do next sort of thing. Like, you know, it's important mentally for that to happen. Yeah, I think it's vital. It really, really is important because, you know, it's, um, we saw obviously the, uh, the goal, the German goalkeeper, um, obviously killed himself, um, a few years back. Um, and I think it's important to note that just because these football, you know, these young footballers in the Premier League now, just because they've got millions and millions of pounds in the bank, it doesn't make them immune from things like depression um, and gambling and addiction and suicidal thoughts, particularly when they get to the end of their career or if their career is cut short. So it's vital that we give them the tools and the clubs give them the tools when they're young to manage their life as best they can, manage their career, help them through their career, but also help them when their career finishes, whether it's to go into coaching or media or whatever it may be, you know, whatever it may be, if they just want to retire and go and live their life. But it's important to make sure that I think they've got the tools to deal with certain things, but also that if the, if the game, if you like, the clubs, the FA, whatever it may be, can do all they can to help those players, then it's only a good thing. Yeah. Definitely. So thanks so much, Willie, for coming on again and uh, being so honest with me with all this stuff. It's uh, been really cool. Uh, so, guys, you can follow us on Twitter at AceCast underscore Nation. If 
You come and follow us on Facebook, which is Ace Podcast Nation. You can suggest show subjects, ask up upcoming guest questions, as well as give us a suggestion for the name of our recently debuted film and TV series, which is currently called The Podcast With No Name. Uh, if you send in your suggestion, you can send in as many suggestions for that name as you want. And every if you are selected, every time you we read the title, your name will be read with it. Uh, there's also going to be regular competitions and giveaways on our social media. Uh, we recently gave away an Amazon Alexa and an Amazon gift card. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, all those sites for audio downloads. Uh, obviously, the video versions are on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but get involved in the comments and hit us up on social media. Uh, thank you again, Willie. Cheers, mate. And cheers, Simon. Cheers. All the best, Bob. And cheers to everyone else for watching. Cheers. Bye.